Introducing our first panel is Carolyn Johnson uh, from the Boston Globe. Please welcome Carolyn Johnson. Um, should I turn this mic on or can you hear me? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm a reporter at the Boston Globe. I write for a very general audience and something that has always kind of interested me about the genome and the high level of public interest is driven by the knowledge that it's not just going to be people who are seeking out this information, who are early adopters of technology, but eventually we're all going to run into this kind of information in our daily lives with our, you know, with our doctors, maybe as a prenatal diagnosis. There's all kinds of ways that, you know, genomes are going to appear in medicine. And this panel is about where that's happening now, where it's going, and what some of the implications are, what people are learning along the way. So. The way it's going to work is everyone's going to give a short talk about their own work and then we'll have a moderated discussion and take questions at the end. Um, so the first speaker is Dr. Robert Green. He's a medical geneticist at Brigham and Women's Hospital um, and he's long worked on this question of how genomes come into medicine. I first encountered his work with um, a study he did of the implications of learning genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, and over the years since then, he's just expanded. He was running a major clinical trial looking at how to practically, logistically, and ethically return data to healthy individuals, to sick individuals, and to even to parents and babies. So he's um, going to lead us off with our first talk. Thanks, Caroline, and thank you all for inviting me to make a few remarks here. It's uh, fantastic to be in front of you because you really are the trailblazers. I've learned so much from George and from this community, um, and much of what I, it's, it's a really interesting position to be in because much of what I might talk about is very, very um, radical to the medical genetics community, but to you it may sound ho-hum. We'll see. Uh, I, I think it's very interesting to take note of the spectrum of where people think science should lie and is lying. Uh, I've got just a few minutes, so I'm not going to go deeply into our research arena, but just sort of touch base on what some of the big questions are as we move forward toward genomic medicine. And uh, just to, as I always do, just mention my disclosures and. Uh, so one of the big questions that I've been interested in since the beginning of, of my interest in this 14 or 15 years ago is what happens when this sort of information interacts with people and with doctors? The, the, this information, genomic information, is somewhat special. It's been anointed as special within our society. It does carry some special features. And the balance between that information as simple medical information, that information as narrative information that tells you about ancestry, that information as destiny, that entire narrative is fascinating as it plays out in both medicine and outside of medicine. So as Carolyn alluded to, uh, about 14 years ago started a study called the REVEAL study, Risk Evaluation and Education for Alzheimer's Disease, in which we explored using this very simple model of APOE risk for Alzheimer's disease, an un then untreatable, now untreatable disease, how people perceived, remembered, dealt with, uh, and, and understood uh, genetic information and risk. I'm not going to go into this, although uh, we're still publishing papers from this study, but um, all these are on our website and I'm happy to talk to you further about them. But really I want to think today about what happens when you move beyond a single genetic test to multiple genetic tests. And of course the sequence is one of the sort of farthest extensions of that. And there are studies now that have been, have been looking at this in an observational way. So for example, the Coriel Collaborative is a ongoing study, a fairly low profile study, but it's been steadily providing SNP-based information to individuals and their doctors uh, through the Coriel Institute um, for a number of years now and tracking what, what happens to those people and, and what they do with it. You all are part of and know about the Personal Genome Project, which uh, blazed the trail in, in providing sequence information to individuals and to society at large. 
The Multiplex Initiative was an NIH observational study that is looking at providing, again, SNP information for 8 to 15 conditions in a very controlled way within a medical system in the Ford Detroit situation. And many of you may know about uh, Les Biesecker's CleanSeq study in which he's taken people with variable risk of cardiovascular disease and providing uh, genomic information back to them using through genetic counselors. So these are all observational studies uh, that um, have been critically important in understanding how genomic information is to be used either with individuals or within a medical system. And of course, the biggest experiment of all has been direct to consumer genetic testing in which SNP-based testing and risk, uh, risk information uh, on that basis and, and an occasional mutational of um, uh, high penetrance mutational uh, signal has been shared with hundreds of thousands of individuals through consumer uh, genomics. And these are all opportunities to explore what people do with this information. So for example, we got a, p a specific grant asking uh, what do customers do with direct-to-consumer information. Arguably, this is a, a natural experiment in receiving incidental information because nobody who signs up for this, they may have something in mind that they're interested in, but nobody actually knows everything they're going to get uh, when they sign up for it. So we uh, have uh, just completed data collection on something we call the PGEN study, which is impact of personal genomics. and. Uh, very simple, straightforward data gathering process. We uh, consented individuals before they actually received their results. We baseline surveyed them before they received the results, basically asking, why did you do this? What is it you hoped to accomplish? And uh, then we followed them up with surveys immediately after they got their results and then six months after they got their results. And uh, an advantage over other types of surveys, we actually got them to give us their genetic information. So we could really ask, what is it you wanted and thought you were going to get? What is it you actually got? And what did you think you got? And what did you do with the information uh, after you got it? And so for one thing, there's been a lot of controversy about whether all of this genomic information is going to make people anxious. And in point of fact, as a group, people who learned their genetic um, information through these companies, this was 23andMe and Pathway, um, had less anxiety shortly after receiving their uh, information. Uh, and then by six months, it had gone back up to baseline. Uh, in fact, anxiety had nothing to do with your risk. It turns out that if you took the quartile of people who, by bad luck or bad protoplasm, had the most risk of all, and those they were at the highest risk levels on the most number of conditions, and you compared them to the people who found out they were at the lowest risk level on the most number of conditions, uh, it turns out that uh, there was no correlation with anxiety in terms of how they perceived these results. What would you think uh, was the only variable that correlated, and we looked at everything, we looked at gender, we looked at age, we looked at whether you're married or not, we looked at whether you had a family history of a genetic disease, we looked at all these things. What do you think is the only variable that correlates with whether or not you get anxious when you receive your genomic results? Anybody guesses? Hairstyle. Hairstyle? <laughs> Close. Whether you're working or whether you have a job. Whether you have a job or not, employment, no. Nope. Education. Education, no. Nope. How much TV you watch? No. Nope. Gender? Gender? Nope. It turns out that the only predictor is whether or not you're an anxious person to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> now, yes, this is a little bit this is a little bit circular, but but not quite so much as you might think. We're not just talking about whether you're anxious or not. We're talking about whether you respond with anxiety when you get your risk information, and it turns out there's a strong correlation, and that's what we've seen in the reveal study as well. So what do people do with genomic information? You know, part of the controversy about this is not whether it's right or wrong to give people genomic information. Part of the controversy is whether they're going to take action that is meaningful, medically useful, or wasteful, and possibly even dangerous. So there's a strong, intuitively powerful narrative that if we're given risk information, that we're at risk for something, we will act in a rational way 
to try to diminish our risk and that that's good for us and good for society. Well, is that really happening? So we, we asked, what are people doing in terms of their risk information? And if you look, look at the bottom line there, you see that the bottom line is that 11% of the individuals who got genetic information from these two companies reported that within six months they'd had tests, exams, or procedures that were stimulated by the genetic information that they received. Okay, well that's, that's important because that is utilization of healthcare resources. And when you show that, I didn't think 11% was so big a deal, but when I sat down with some insurance executives and said, hey, 11% of people say they, uh, they went and did something based on these results, they said, oh, that's really big. If you gave the country all their genetic information back and 11% of them got, te got tests, exams, and procedures due to it, um, that's a huge amount of healthcare resources that's being spent. Right, so then the question becomes, are you using that in a way that is rational and that improves your health? Or are you using it in a way that's not rational and doesn't improve your health? We don't really know the full answer to that yet. We're trying to tease some of these data apart, but let me show you part of it. Part of it is that people say that they make improvements in their diet and exercise, uh, and then none of them say, none of them seem to succumb to false reassurance. None of them say, oh, I'm at low risk for diabetes, so pass me the jelly donuts. Um, and on another slide that I don't have here, uh, we actually looked, for example, to see if people who were at common complex elevated risk for breast cancer actually went out and were more likely to do breast self-examinations, to do mammography, or to do uh, other breast sort of evaluations. And we found there was no correlation between the risk information they got from the test and uh, their, their interest in going out and getting these surveillance. So putting it together, what this may suggest is that the entire experience serves as a teachable moment and does stimulate you to move in directions you perhaps know you were supposed to move in anyway. Uh, what we're not finding yet is a kind of rational link between I'm elevated on my risk of breast cancer, therefore I'm going to go and increase my breast self-examinations or my mammographies. So we're, we're just at the start of teasing these data apart. It's going to be fascinating to see how this works. Now, it's a good thing we got this data when we got it, right? Because as you know, the FDA has uh, politely asked that uh, 23andMe stop giving its uh, uh, service in terms of health-related stuff. Almost all the geneticists in the country, uh, in my view, have exhibited a, uh, a fair amount of schadenfreude about this. Uh, oh, you know, I knew that they were, they were getting out of line there. So this was important for that to happen. Uh, and um, Nita Farahani and I uh, actually uh, took a different view, and we're one of the few sort of people from conventional medicine to to write that maybe the FDA was being a little overcautious, given that over 600,000 people have actually experienced this, given the m modest, if any, harms that we've been able to report even anecdotally. Um, I think there are legitimate questions about, re about utilization resource. There are legitimate questions about um, who should pay for things like this and whether it uh, increases the sort of unnecessary use of the healthcare system. Those are important to answer. Uh, I think there are legitimate questions about how companies express the probabilistic findings, and, and, uh, but, but it seems somewhat uh, overcautious to uh, shut down a service entirely, uh, given where it is at this moment in time and given what people have said they've wanted. Well, moving to what I think you guys are most interested in, basically, is how should we use whole genome sequencing in the practice of medicine and perhaps outside the practice of medicine, because companies that are interested in direct-to-consumer SNP testing are also obviously thinking about and exploring the arena of uh, direct-to-consumer or hybrid versions of direct-to-consumer uh, personalized genomic medicine with sequencing. And here we are very fortunate to have been funded in one of the first uh, CSER grants. This is a consortium of grants funded by NHGRI, 
Uh, we call ours the MedSeq project. And the whole idea is there's so much information in the genome, so much that's potentially helpful. How is the clinician actually supposed to help with this? Because you guys are pioneers. You're very independent. You want this information. Many of you are kind of willing to pour through it yourself. Or, but, but the vast majority of surveys suggest that if people, regular people, want genomic information, they want to be able to share it with their doctors. They want their doctors to partner with them and, and, and help them understand what to do with it and where to go with it. How do we get medicine and doctors in that place? Because it's, right now it's extremely confusing and it's extremely intimidating. Doctors don't have time. They're not reimbursed. And the whole system is somewhat dysfunctional in terms of learning new disruptive technologies like this before they're proven to have a clear benefit. So we have uh, actually published our, our protocol, which uh, just in the last few days, which I'd love for you guys to um, look at if you're interested, in which we have a randomized clinical trial where an entire group of physicians and their patients receive whole genome sequencing, the, the patients do, not the physicians, and uh, another randomized group does not. We're looking at this both in patients with a heritable uh, genetic disease and in generally healthy patients. And as you, you may hear from Heidi Rehm uh, and we'll hear from other speakers, an enormous challenge in this is the variant filtering and interpretation and how we get through that in a way that makes sense of likely pathogenic and pathogenic variants, both known and novel for a given person. How do we integrate prior probabilities uh, of family history and not having family history into the decision of what goes on a report and what gets handed back to a family. Because the, the, the notion that you can give everything back is simply uh, not going to fly in clinical medicine. Uh, it's, there's going to have to be some sort of judgment made about the um, validity and utility of the information that's being reported back to physicians so they can report it back to patients and act on it. So in keeping with this philosophy, just in the same way that a um, physician doesn't have to be a radiologist or nuclear physicist to read a radiology report, we think that doctors don't have to be genomicists to read a genome report. And we've created with Heidi and the LMM a one-page whole genome sequence summary, which we're very proud of, which has easy to understand categories. And uh, this is described in that paper I mentioned by Vassi et al. So, you know, I think I'm preaching to the converted here, uh, but um, you probably all have a strong feeling that sequencing is good and beneficial. Uh, and if you do believe that, if it's good as, for you as an adult, is it even better for you as an infant? And so uh, the question of sequencing newborns has arisen. It's uh, an even more controversial area in conventional medical genetics because there, is, there are concerns about long-term um, implications of information that babies might not actually want to have once they grow up. There's concerns about bonding, but people really want this. People say they want this information for their baby. And when we did a survey of newborn parents at Brigham Women's Hospital, this, this is what we found. They want it. They want it even if you ask them later, three months later. They want it even after you give them a bunch of mock results that are really scary. So people want this for their children. And uh, I think we have to address. So we're fortunate to have been funded for something that we're now calling the BabySeq Project, which is another one of these NH, NIH large randomized clinical trial. Meanwhile, clinical sequencing is underway and the issue of incidental findings needs to be handled in a medical context. Now, if you're a healthy person who's been sequenced, everything that's found in you that implicates disease is an incidental or unexpected finding, except in the sense that we expect to find things. The, the language here is sort of troubling. He, you know, and, and you'll always talk at one of these meetings and somebody will say, well, you can't call it incidental, you can't call it unexpected, you shouldn't call it secondary. We're just using incidental as a catch-all for those things. And as those of you like Andy here knows, we uh, uh, did publish recommendations for uh, what variants should be reported back to every individual by a laboratory who sequences on a clinical um, basis. Uh, we, d we described a minimum list of 56 genes and representing 24 conditions that laboratories should standardize their search and reporting of. And we felt this was consistent with the practice of medicine and with the expectations of patients. Now. Um, 
I won't ask you to read all this. It's basically cardiovascular variants and cancer variants. Um, and it's a very small part of the genome. If you take all the exome variants, you take all the disease-associated variants, and you take all the ACMG variants and look at just the types of variants we recommended, it's a very, very small subset of the genome. Um, this crowd might say, well, that's just really stupid. You should give back lots more than that. But I have to tell you that the crowd that uh, is, is actually doing clinical sequencing in the clinic uh, is quite um, exercised about this. And uh, there's uh, quite a lot of um, critical writing about the, the list, the conditions under which we suggested the list be used and um, whether or not the state of the science was sufficient to uh, have done this at all. But we've, we've argued back that this is, uh, is happening and that uh, doctors need to be implementing it. So to wrap up, what's the right analogy when you're doing a sequence? So Ryan, let's say you get whole genome sequence for a heart problem uh, and the lab runs uh, an analysis that looks at all your genes and happens to look at cancer predisposition genes. Uh, the question is, do they have an obligation to tell you that? And uh, do you want to know that? And most people would say yes, but a surprising number of people feel that this is an inappropriate uh, question, that, it's, uh, that the proper analogy is not the chest x-ray where you find a nodule, but somehow the whole body scan where you're looking way beyond the scope of the test that's been ordered. So I leave you with this question, should healthy people have their genome sequenced at this time? Most of you have already answered that for yourself, but this is a major salient question out there in the world. I've debated it with Atul um, Boot in uh, Wall Street Journal, and uh, you've already gotten your sequence done, many of you, but for those of you who haven't and would prefer to do it in a medical context, uh, if you've had your, your sequence PG, uh, done by PGP and you would like it interpreted by a medical lab, we can do that. We have a personal genome consultation service that's in, in collaboration with PGP, and you can simply email me and we can, um, we can get this evaluated through our uh, now CLIA-approved filtration system and um, give you a sort of medically oriented report in a doctor's office. If you're not interested in that um, or you haven't had your sequence ever done before, um, we can also do your sequence from CLIA start to finish um, and we can share it with PGP. Anyway, I want to thank um, NIH for their, for their support of all of our research and I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the panel and to the conversations that we can have together. Thanks. Next, we have Michael Linderman, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Genetics and Genomic Sciences at the Icon Institute for Genomics and Multiscale Biology at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Um, he works on kind of the integrating genomics into clinical care as well, but um, just as Robert mentioned just now, that doctors don't need to be um, card carrying, you know, geneticists in order to just do primary care. He is actually in charge of a class where they give students the opportunity to explore the science, the technical, the ethical, the practical implications of uh, the genome by examining their own genomes. So um, please welcome Michael. So Thank you very much, and thank you to Jason and the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Uh, I'm really excited to be a part of this. Uh, as you just mentioned, I'm going to talk about a course called Practical Analysis of Your Personal Genome, right? And as you sort of get a hint from the title, right, the really unique feature of this course is that we offer students the opportunity to obtain and analyze over the course of a semester their whole genome sequence. So I want to tell you about why and how we did that and what we have learned along the way. So the delta between or the gap or the demand for whole exome and whole genome sequencing and the number of genetics professionals with genomics training is incredibly large. So we think that 
education about next generation sequencing has to be a part of every genetics training program. When we talk about education here, we're not talking about a handful of lectures or a survey course, but direct hands-on experience with this data where students are able to uh, confront and master the complexity of this information. We chose to focus on whole genome sequencing because we think this is the future of medical genomics and in the uh, Wayne Gretzky sense, we want to skate to where the puck is going. So we want our students to have experience with the greater complexity and scale that comes with that kind of data. And we hypothesize, and data from, Harvard, uh, from Stanford sorry, has subsequently only strengthen that hypothesis, that students who work with their own genomic data are going to be more engaged, they're going to be more motivated, and they're ultimately going to have better educational outcomes. And that's what we're seeking to have here. So it's a very long way of saying something that Eric Tobel said and much more succinctly about the course back at the 2012 AAMC meeting. But I want to point out that I very precisely and very carefully said hypothesize. We want to evaluate whether offering students this kind of information in the educational setting actually really does result in those improved educational outcomes that we hypothesize. And that can we do this in a way that does not cause distress that might ultimately reduce as opposed to improve their educational outcomes. So around this course, we built a companion research study that seeks to evaluate the educational and psychosocial impact of incorporating genomic information into an educational context, and particularly incorporating whole genome sequencing derived information. So this takes, you know, translational genomics is a truly multidisciplinary effort, right? And this is only possible because we're able to assemble a team with an incredibly diverse set of expertise. So I included their pictures here to try to embarrass them on YouTube later, but also to give you a sense of the scope of people that are involved in making like some, something like this possible from the sort of very uh, low-level technology side to folks who are focused on very much on how you communicate genomic results to individuals. So as I mentioned, the heart of this is a semester-long laboratory-style course called Practical Analysis of Your Personal Genome. But this is actually only one part of a larger sequence. So students who want to participate in that course are required to take a prerequisite introductory course called Introduction to Human Genome Sequencing that in 2012, when we first did this, was about 26 hours and it's since been reduced. This serves as the heart of the informed consent procedure, the informed decision-making procedure for obtaining your own sequencing data. That in a summer course, as we call it, is sort of a compressed version of everything that the students are going to encounter in the fall in much greater detail. And the goal is to give them a sense of the kinds of information that they can receive, and particularly the limitations that are inherent in this technology. So as I mentioned, this is done in the context of a research study, so with five different uh, questionnaires, so before and after the summer course, before and after the fall, and then finally at a six-month follow-up where we're trying to assess any educational and psychosocial impacts. So in 2012, we enrolled 20 students into the summer course. Of those, 20, 19 went on to the fall course. One had to drop out for reasons that have nothing to do with sequencing. And we drew from a fairly diverse audience here from within the medical school. Right? Uh, one thing to note is these are all obviously individuals who are genetically interested, right? You didn't sign up for this course, which is an elective, if you weren't excited about the possibility for genomics, right? And many of them are current and future genetics professionals. So I would have to say I agree with Robert. This isn't about ensuring that every single physician can start from a fast queue and take that all the way forward, but to build the genomics professionals that will ultimately deliver the kind of medical genomics that we anticipate in the future. So we are very mindful of the risks that come with genomic information and wanted to talk a little bit about the different strategies that we employ to try to mitigate those risks. So there are three areas that we're particularly concerned about, the chance for coercion, the chance of loss of privacy, and then the potential for distress. So over here on the right are some of the things that we did to try to mitigate those. So first and foremost, sequencing is completely optional. Students can either work with their own genome or a reference genome that's been gender matched, and they can switch at any time. That is, they can decide that they no longer want to work with their own genome and want to use that reference genome. Instructors are blinded to the choices that students make, and students know that, so they don't feel that there's any educational consequences for not choosing to work with their own genome. The students control, exclusively control access to their own data. Once we deliver that result back to them, they have the only copy in the world of that data, and whatever they choose to do with it is theirs. If they delete it, it's gone forever. To mitigate distress, we had a number of mechanisms. First is that introductory course that I mentioned that tries to provide the knowledge that they'll need to make an informed choice. 
we offered one-on-one -on -one optional genetic counseling for them on or off campus if they wanted to explore issues in their particular family medical history. And then finally, as part of the course itself, they have the opportunity to set up exclusion regions to mask off portions of the genome that they don't want to see as part of the analysis pipeline. And I should mention, all of this is happening at no cost to them. So what do they learn about? Well, they are, first of all, from a sequencing perspective, we are sequencing the students to 30x, uh, Lumina High seq 2500 in a CapClia uh, facility. They receive those raw, fast cues, and then they take the analysis all the way through using the genome analysis pipeline that supports our clinical operations. So they're doing all of this analysis themselves. They're not receiving a clinical report, and they're not s receiving a consumer-style product either. They get their annotated fast cue with four to five million variants, something very familiar, I imagine, to everyone here. They are receiving a lot of QC information. And they're receiving a little bit of a summary that includes some ancestry information, some well-established pharmacogenomic findings, some physical traits like bitter taster, as well as uh, rare coding variants that appear, appear in about 200 well-known disease genes. So the class itself, as I mentioned, is a laboratory style. Each session is about two hours, and the first part is lecture, focused on the particular scientific topic, and then the second half is that practical side, where they're actually working through exercises related to that topic with their genomic data or relevant reference data. So an example might be uh, looking at their own genotypes to make the translation from that genotype to the relevant pharmacogenomic phenotype for a particular well-known uh, gene like CYP2C19. Right. So we sort of focus on many topics, but mainly within these uh, five areas, and we do this over the course of a semester. This is not a tutorial course. This isn't run BWA, then run GATK, and then do this, and then do this. This is really a, a, an academic course focused as much as possible on the whole aspects of personal genome analysis, but using the opportunity to work with genomic information as that teachable moment, as that catalyst for improving engagement and motivation. So what have we learned so far? Well, we're going to start with the 2012 introductory course and what we think of as the first three time points, that is before and after the summer and before the fall. So this is after they've, up into when they've decided to get sequenced, but before they've received the data. So what we observed here on the upper left is that the introductory course, this sort of intense educational experience, only increases their interest in working with their own genome as we go to many more people who would strongly agree or agree that they want to use their own genomic information. We found that the introductory course, this educational experience, reduces their decisional conflict and makes their decision more certain. And we notice that's there on the bottom left, and we see that drop occurs around the summer course and not in the time between the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall. So it's not merely the passage of time that's changing their uh, decisional states or their decisional parameters, but it's actually the educational experience itself. But what we did not observe was actually a change in the knowledge questions. We incorporated into the questionnaire a number of technical questions, many of them derived from the Stanford study that tried to assess uh, students' knowledge. And this actually turned out to be a very tricky topic, I think. Defining these kinds of questions is a great challenge for us. So what about during and after the course? I'm going to focus here on actually that six-month follow-up time point from 2012, because I think it gives us some space for the students to reflect on their experience. So, uh, quite a substantial portion of the students agreed that analyzing their own genome was very useful. We also observed a large variance in the positive experience and decision satisfaction that the students reported at this time. Very interesting, one student, only one student, reported decision regret and test-related distress. So I think this is a very ex interesting example, and the student very uh, graciously, unfortunately, agreed to participate in an uh, extended follow-up interview along with five other students who actually know a lot about their experience. So I want to tell you about that. So after the course was completed, the student came back and reanalyzed their data with an updated version of the analysis pipeline. In doing so, they observed a variant, a variant of unknown significance, an unexpected variant of unknown significance, in a gene associated with Brugada syndrome, which is a very serious cardiac phenotype. So over about the next 24 to 36 hours, the student themselves uh, further analyzed that variant and determined it to be a benign polymorphism, and the student is by far more than qualified to make that determination. But that period between identifying that variant and making that determination was very stressful, as you might imagine. Moreover, the student had always been a little bit uncertain about working with their own genomic information, but had gone ahead anyway, and this finding only confirmed their worst fears about that experience. So I think that was a very interesting experience that sort of captures some really 
interesting features of having an unexpected result, despite having all the knowledge that such results are possible. So, but what do we learn about their educational impact? Well, I think one of the reoccurring themes that especially came out in our follow-up interviews was that this really, the opportunity to work with your own data, and I imagine this is true for many of you here, drove persistence and motivation. So this is a quote that I pulled out of one of the follow-up interviews that I think really captures this greatly. I think I was much more persistent about it because it was my own, even though it was hard, and we know it's very hard. I was like, no, I really want to look this up, so I'm going to figure out how to do it. I think if I was going to do someone else's genome, I wouldn't really care what the results were, so I may not have put in as much effort in the analysis because I think it was really difficult to do. And I think that really captures the value that can come with working with your own data and the self-interest that that drives. So what are some things that, other things that we learned? Some of which we've already heard today. So one, whole genome sequencing at the rawest level is both overwhelming in the scope of the data that you receive and in sometimes a little bit underwhelming for healthy individuals in terms of what you find. I think many of our students had expectations that they would find more stuff in there, that they were more interesting. Many of them are coming from a very classical magetic, medical genetics community where they're exposed to lots of really dramatic variants, and I think they had some, uh, you know, they didn't find things like that. We know that the students report being more persistent and empathetic as a result of analyzing their own genome, and a number of them, I think, believe 10 out of the 15 that have, we've talked to in the follow-up, a mere six months later have already reported using the skills that they developed as part of their professional <laughs> practice. Over the course of the semester, despite our efforts, most students directly or indirectly self-disclose their sequencing choice in the conversations that they have with us or in class. That the combination of personal curiosity and the unique and value opportunity to be sequenced in the context of this course was a common motivator and may cause students to make decisions they might not have otherwise, such as in the case I talked about earlier. One of the, the things that was different about this course as opposed to others, and particularly that at Stanford, which offered access to 23andMe, albeit at a reduced price, is that our students can obtain this service uh, in really in any other way. So in addition to the financial costs associated with genome sequencing, it's not very accessible, particularly for residents of New York State. So this represents a very unique opportunity that has both a financial cost and a, an opportunity cost. Then from a very personal perspective, the boundary between educating and interpreting by the instructors is very challenging to maintain. The class is a very intimate setting and a very intimate experience, and many of the students and the faculty have uh, complex and supervisory relationships outside this setting, but in that room, they're having a very different relationship. We're focused on an educational, not clinical experience, and that's sometimes challenging to maintain in that setting, as you might imagine. So I think really the, the key question I'm sure you're all wondering is, do we think it's worth it? It's expensive, for sure, so are we getting good value? And the answer is we don't know yet, right? And we might not for a long time. So you know, we have a very small end here. We've now done 38 students over the course of two years, and we're about to start up again with another 20. And we don't actually have a good comparison arm because to date, all but one student has chosen to work with their own genome. So we don't have a, 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 it's more observational than comparison driven. Now, and it certainly is, as I mentioned, expensive, but as we saw already in the graphs that make an appearance every time, those costs are dropping rapidly. And so that's no longer going to be a barrier, and it's strictly going to be a question of whether we think we can deliver better educational outcomes without distress by incorporating personal genomic information into the educational setting. So what are we working on going forward to better answer these questions? Well, one, we're engaging in long-term tracking of our graduates. We're trying to develop improved knowledge measures that are targeted not at lay populations but at genetics professionals to help us better assess whether we're having, we are obtaining better educational outcomes. And we're focusing on restructuring uh, how we set the class up to try to create a meaningful control arm, although we're having some trouble doing that. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a huge endeavor that involves a great number of people, and this is just a, a small part of all the folks that make this possible. And then we've had an absolutely incredible set of students across the two years and looking forward to another great set coming up. They are now incredibly well-trained genomics professionals, so are you in the market for people like that? Let me know, because they're truly amazing. All right, thank you very much. Our last speaker is Dr. Diana Bianchi. She is executive director of the Mother Infant 
uh, Research Institute at Tufts University School of Medicine. Um, she's worked extensively on developing methods to isolate fetal cells from maternal blood, and so she's bringing us back to the womb. We've been hearing a lot about um, genome sequencing of adults, people who can give consent, I guess even babies, but it gets into an even more interesting um, and somewhat controversial area when you're talking about prenatal diagnosis. Um, so, Diana. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you, George and Jason, for inviting me. Um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead here. Uh, I forgot to put my Twitter name on the slide. It's at Diana Bianchi, MD. And that's to distinguish me from the other Diana Bianchi who broke up Christy Brinkley's fourth marriage. <laughs> and she's not, a, she's not a nice person. So just, we're completely different people. So I want to go over, and I'm not sure why my slide backgrounds haven't shown up, but that maybe they were taken away in the formatting. Uh, we were given an assignment by Jason, which was to discuss the genomics and the practice of medicine today. And he asked us specifically to talk about where the genomes are being applied. And so I'm going to talk to you literally about how the rubber is meeting the road in the area of prenatal sequencing. And the other question he asked is, how is it going? Well, I, I, again, I think for this crowd, you're, you're already skating to where the, the puck is out of the arena and on another planet. I mean, I'm going to talk to you about really some of the issues that we deal with on a daily basis because the incorporation of genome sequencing in the prenatal context has truly changed the practice of prenatal medicine in an incredibly short time. So it's a, it's a very different aspect of personal genomes, but very interesting. So why the world that I live in is prenatal sequencing and diagnosis and prenatal treatment as well. But why is per prenatal personalized genomics different from the other sequencing applications? And the other speakers so far have sort of briefly danced around this, but they're clearly medical, ethical, and legal issues that are associated with the fetus and the pregnant woman. First of all, the fetus is not a separate individual during, during the pregnancy. You're really not a separate individual until you're born. And that sounds like an easy thing to say, but, but there are all kinds of complicated issues that come up in the practice of prenatal medicine. You, you may not know the phenotype when you're sequencing an adult individual, but you really don't know it when you're sequencing a fetus. You don't even have the benefit of a physical exam. You only have an indirect examination, maybe from an ultrasound examination. And an ultrasound examination is not the complete equivalent of a physical examination. And you're sort of getting this information. You may have a family history. You may not. So you're getting the inf information independent of the usual clinical context that you would get if you were sequencing a child or an adult. And then the elephant in the room. You have the capability in most places of being able to terminate a pregnancy if it less than 24 weeks of gestation. So you know, you, you don't have the same situation when you're dealing with a child or an adult, but when you give potentially troubling information to a pregnant woman and her partner, and you don't have the information to interpret or annotate um, that raw sequence data, for example, in a situation where pregnant women are emotionally vulnerable, you run the risk of giving them information that will, ha uh, you know, uh, somehow result in a decision to terminate the pregnancy when, in fact, that baby or child would have been a healthy individual. Furthermore, as I'm going to tell you, give you some examples, um, there's unex unintended or unexpected information that we're already finding out. When we think we're looking for prenatal screening for Down syndrome, we're finding out some interesting things um, because we are sequencing the cell-free DNA in the plasma of the pregnant woman, and that's the mother and the fetus. And some of the things that we already know about are mistaken paternity, a variety of maternal abnormalities, things that we're finding out about the woman that truly affect her health. So for those of you who are not involved in prenatal sequencing or diagnosis, there are 
well-described st standard practices that occur that are mainly um, more or less um, uh, legislated by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology in their various practice bulletins. I'm a medical geneticist, not an obstetrician, but the field of obstetrics and gynecology is so litigious that to not practice by these standards really is a problem for obstetricians. So these, these practice bulletins essentially establish the standard of care. They come out every few years. And in 2007, there were two practice bulletins that basically said every pregnant woman needs to be offered the opportunity to screen for major chromosome abnormalities in their fetus. And so every woman is offered the opportunity. On average, about 60% of women nationally right now accept that opportunity, except in California where it's about 90% because of a specific California <coughs> state prenatal screening program. And women are currently offered a combination of blood biochemical tests and ultrasound tests. And then if those are high risk, they come in, they meet with a genetic counselor, and they're offered the opportunity for an invasive diagnostic procedure. And then if the fetus is abnormal, they return for genetic counseling where they are advised um, of their options. Now what's different about the currently clinically available means of prenatal sequencing um, are the fact that it's really a counting algorithm. So what happens is a pregnant woman's blood sample is taken and there are already fragmented DNA molecules floating in the plasma of the pregnant woman. There's a combination of maternal and fetal. It's about 90% maternal derived from her own uh, bone marrow essentially and 10% fetal which is coming from the placenta, not the fetus. Those molecules are sequenced and then aligned to a reference map of the genome. And the way it works, there are different iterations. There are currently four companies in the United States that are offering the testing and they're doing it slightly differently. But at the end of the day, it's counting relative to a reference. And if you have increased number of counts, mapping to chromosome 21, you receive um, a report that says that aneuploidy is detected. The fetus is at risk for trisomy 21. And I just want to communicate how rapid this timeline has been to clinical applications. So the first concepts that you could use molecular counting as opposed to a different way of detecting a whole chromosome aneuploidy were really published only in 2007. That was followed by some proof of principle experiments that showed you could, in a blinded experiment, detect Down syndrome, trisomy 18. Um, and these were followed very quickly by a number of multiple blinded clinical trials. Our group participated and published in a number of them. Um, and all of the trials around the world showed excellent sensitivity and specificity for the detection of both trisomies 21 and 18, which are the most common fetal whole chromosome autosomal aneuploidies. And this was followed by commercial um, availability on October 17, 2011. Sequinome uh, made the first test available for trisomy 21 using maternal blood. And um, because of intense competition and litigation between the companies, there's a constant um, push to advance the number of testing options available. In July of 2012, Veronata, now Illumina, made uh, massively parallel sequencing available for monosomy X, or Turner syndrome. And this was followed very quickly by adding to the report fetal sex determination. Um, so this, I'm, I'm not sure why these are, these are formatting a little bit differently, but um, because of the intense interest, because consumers were rapidly taking these tests, the professional societies also quickly got into the game, met and established some professional recommendations. So the NSGC is the National Society of Genetic Counselors, ACOG, I already mentioned, and ACMG, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. And they had a lot of agreement on the fact that, first of all, doing non-invasive prenatal testing using sequencing of maternal plasma DNA is a, is a screening tool. 
it should be offered to high-risk patients only, with the exception that ACMG did not say anything about that, and that um, there should be both pre-test and post-test genetic counseling because of the possibility of these unanticipated results being detected in the mother, and that because it's a screening test, it's not diagnostic, it should be confirmed with an invasive diagnostic procedure, which would be chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis. Now, ACMG did not say anything about um, high risk versus low risk. Uh, initially, the, you know, all the groups were saying high risk, and nobody knew about the performance in low risk. And we completed a study in February this year that was published in the New, New England Journal of Medicine that basically showed the way the test performs is exactly the same whether the woman is a high-risk patient or a low-risk patient. Furthermore, this study showed that the current standard of care, the serum biochemistry, had a much higher false positive rate, which leads to a lot more unnecessary testing, and that testing with the amniocentesis or the CVS is associated with a small risk of miscarriage. So I'm just mentioning all this to show you how, how much the um, sequencing really has affected the field. Now the way that we use um, the testing, again, I've been talking mainly about high-risk pregnant women. How can you be high-risk? Well, it's if you're over age 35 at the time of delivery, if you have a fetus with a major anatomic abnormality detected by sonogram, if you have abnormal traditional screening with the serum biochemistry, or if you have a family history of a fetus or a child with Down syndrome or other major chromosome abnormality. So the high-risk pregnant women come in, they get genetic counseling, and then they're offered a variety of options. They can, of course, do nothing. They can have traditional screening, which is fully paid by insurance. They can have non-invasive prenatal testing using sequencing or they can have diagnostic testing. For the high-risk pregnant woman, the amazing thing is within such a short time, the major insurance companies are paying for non-invasive prenatal testing. So there, at this point, there's very little out-of-pocket cost for a woman who is high risk. The low-risk women are not having the test paid for. And very early on, back in the fall of 2011, we had a big discussion, what happens if a low-risk woman calls us and wants the testing. Are we going to deny it to her? There's really no risk to the fetus of just getting a blood test. So we decided that, that we would offer it with the caveats that we didn't know at that time about the performance of the test. Now we can say the test performs very well in a low-risk woman. But we would tell her that she would have to self-pay for the test. And the results come back either as negative, suspected, or borderline, or positive. Now, the beauty of the test, and this is how it is impacting on clinical care already, is there's virtually a 100% negative predictive value. So whether the woman is high risk or low risk, if the test results are negative and all she wants to know about, does my baby have trisomy 13, 18, or 21, we can confidently tell her that effectively she does not need to do any other testing at this point. There, there are some rare false negatives, but in general, we would advise her that nothing else is advised. If the results are borderline, we would, we would recommend diagnostic testing. And if aneuploidy is detected, we absolutely would recommend confirming with diagnostic testing. Now, what's the impact on care? Um, this is the, the, it's hard to really get a, a precise handle, and I have to say that my numbers are estimated from the genome web, which you can take that with a grain of salt, but at least there's some numbers that are being reported by the gen genome web. And on the y-axis, I have the number of uh, NIPT tests, and then taking the number of procedures in 2011 as the original baseline, what has been the effect? on invasive procedures with the incorporation of these non-invasive blood sequencing tests. And you can see that in a remarkably short time, there, there is, you know, most people are saying somewhere between a 50 and 60 percent reduction in invasive procedures as a result of the incorporation of the test. 
So that's why I titled my talk the way I did, because there has been a huge effect. And the, the reason why women are, are selecting NIPT is that it is safer um, and it's more accurate. So the current approach, um, there's a significant false negative rate with serum biochemistry and the ultrasound tests. So 8 to 10 percent of cases of trisomy 21 are missed. And to get the sensitivity of the current standard tests, they have to call 5 percent of the tests screen positive. And those women are all sent to genetic counseling, as I showed in the earlier slide, to discuss the issue of whether or not they want to have an invasive procedure, which is associated with a small risk of miscarriage. With non-invasive prenatal testing, the false negative rate is significantly less than 0.1 percent. Furthermore, I think the real power of the test is 95 percent of the high-risk women, at least, do not have aneuploidy detected. So therefore, they don't need that invasive procedure. But interestingly, and this is where we get to the area of unintended or unanticipated results in the prenatal world, 0.1 percent of the screen positive cases are the so-called false positives. We prefer the term discordant because the non-invasive prenatal result is discordant with the fetal karyotype from the invasive procedure. And the fascinating thing over the last two years is that we found that there are multiple biological explanations. So here's one. 47 triple X is one of the more common sex chromosome abnormalities. So here's a 25-year-old woman, happened to be in China, who had a normal phenotype and a normal menstrual history. She had a screening test in China in the second trimester. Their standard approach is a biochemical test in the second trimester. And she was told she had a high risk of having a fetus with Down syndrome. She underwent non-invasive prenatal testing which until recently was widely available in China. The Chinese government has actually put a hold on the testing. Um, but here is the z-score for chromosome X. So there's a massively increased amount of chromosome X. Uh, she underwent an invasive procedure. The fetus was shown to be 46XX. So in working that up and trying to find out where the extra X chromosome signal was coming from, they showed that the mother actually was a full 47 triple X. So we unexpectedly determined that she had a sex chromosome abnormality. And the, this is having a major effect on practice. So when 47 triple X is diagnosed, the question is, should we now routinely uh, sequence the mother? And I think, you know, I, I think the answer is yes, because there's subsequently been another study that showed in these cases of X chromosome discordance, about 8.6 percent of the time, the abnormality is coming from the mother, not the fetus. So that's fairly astonishing that there's so many women walking around with unknown sex chromosome abnormalities, and they are fertile. Because as a geneticist, when we see that a woman has 47 triple X, one of the things we counsel her about is the risk of infertility. So what this is, is showing us is that the phenotype of people with sex chromosome abnormalities is much uh, broader than we previously thought. So just quickly, um, there are also discordant results due to maternal metastatic disease. This is one case that was published in prenatal diagnosis. Um, unfortunately, the citation was taken away. But um, the first author is Osborne, prenatal diagnosis 2013 in which there's a woman who was healthy, pregnant, underwent prenatal testing. The results showed a suspicion of trisomy 13 and monosomy 18. This came up again when the sequencing result was repeated. Again, it was confirmed with an amniocentesis. The fetus was completely normal. And in fact, a normal male was born at full term. However, in the interim, a different company also performed the sequencing and came up with the same result. And postpartum, the mother was determined to have um, cancer. So in fact, this is not going to be as uncommon as we previously thought. More recent estimates are that probably about one in a thousand pregnant women are possibly going to have cancer detected as an unintended consequence of this testing. 
and we're already getting questions about what should be the workup for multiple aneuploidies detected on prenatal testing. So just quickly, um, this is a, a race car. I know Robert showed a race car as well. There's a little bit of a difference here in that the testing currently is only available through industry, so there's an additional level of competition. I've talked only this morning, the limited time, about the autosomal aneuploidies, but we're already here into 2014 in which selected microdeletion syndromes are being offered as well as additional trisomies that generally result in miscarriage. But we are clearly moving towards non-invasive sequencing of the whole fetal genome. So my take-home points are the following. Um, Non-invasive prenatal testing performs better and it's safer than standard screening. It's got higher sensitivities, specificities, specifically for the detection of autosomal aneuploidies. It's got higher positive predictive values. I didn't have a chance to go into that. Lower false positive rates, even in the low risk cases. And it's already had a major impact on care and reducing invasive procedures. And then the discordant positive cases are already resulting in the detection of other unexpected conditions. So we are already dealing with the consequences of having to come up with recommendations for the follow-up of women who are detected, for example, with these multiple aneuploidies. So I'd like to mention, I believe my conflicts are um, disclosed on the disclosure page, but I do work, um, sorry. I do work with Illumina, and um, they do fund some of the research in my laboratory, which is focused on the prenatal treatment of Down syndrome, and we are also funded by NICHD. Thank you very much for your attention. So thanks for those three talks, which really span the whole lifespan and I think bring up a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> um, that are interrelated, but I guess maybe we start off the discussion by this question of when in the lifespan is like, when do you think this is gonna happen? Obviously a lot of people in this audience have, as adults, made decisions. You're talking about um, you know, mothers making decisions before they've even given birth. You're talking about babies, um, as well as like people who might have a medical mystery. Like, and is this like the kind of test people are gonna have multiple times in their life? Like how do you see this, I know we're kind of projecting into the future, but unfolding as information and that follows someone or has to be repeatedly gotten? You can start down there. You're gonna have to call. Well, I'll, I'll say I really believe that we're gonna need to get the information prenatally to have the maximum effect. I mean. I mentioned the concerns. There, there's just a huge number of ethical and practical concerns, but it, it, there's clear evidence for many genetic conditions that the pathology begins in the womb. So you have a window of opportunity in the womb to really begin to treat the fetus. And that's why there's been so much excitement about fetal surgery. Unfortunately, fetal surgery has, you know, it has some successes, but it hasn't totally lived up to the hype. But it, it's incredibly powerful to know that your baby will have such and such a condition. And given the options, most pregnant women will do something if it's safe and shown to be effective. So I'd like to argue that in fetal life is an incredible, incredibly powerful opportunity. Do you have an opinion? <laughs> well, I think we could start with what's happening now. There is, um, for mysterious illnesses that appear to have a genetic uh, etiology, uh, whole exome and whole genome sequencing is being sent now for diagnostic purposes. And there is a, uh, it's not being reimbursed necessarily consistently across the country, but it is being sent. And that is the sort of opening wedge in, uh, in the battle, if you will, to incorporate genomic medicine. And the insurance companies and, um, are, are being very clear that reimbursement will require clear-cut outcomes of benefit. So I think that uh, one of the challenges is ours and other people's research that's actually looking at whether there is downstream medical benefit that, uh, and cost effectiveness that's actually documentable. Mm -hmm. 
So, so, go ahead. And I was going to say, I, I think actually it, you mentioned happening many times, and I think that's the most likely outcome, that it will happen at many points in your life, mm -hmm. both as a practical matter, I think as a, as a system, our ability to maintain information for someone over the span of 60 or 70 years, which is what we're talking about, is, is just not going to happen. I think also, from a technology perspective, the genome that you get today is not going to be nearly as good as the genome potentially that you're going to get in a year, or two years, or five years, or 20 years, or 30 years. So I think it would be something that would happen prenatally, that would happen at birth, that would happen at adulthood, if you were interested, that would happen when you came in uh, to get a stent and all the points in between. But I, but I think it's important for the, not this audience, but the wider audience is that, you know, to know that your genome doesn't change, the technology is going to change, and maybe the interpretation of the genome will change, and unless there's a way of communicating the results of your prenatal sequence to your doctor when you are uh, an adult, that you will have to repeat it, but it's not because your genome is changing. And also, this, this audience, I think, is very sophisticated, but there are two things that I think the general public doesn't, or the, the general public misunderstands about sequencing. One is the limitations of sequencing. So for example, um, insertions, deletions above a certain size, uh, repeat elements are simply not well found in most sequencing technologies and analysis pipelines at this moment in time. So it's not, you know, the, the ethically challenging question of Huntington disease is, is irrelevant because you can't find the Huntington mutation in a whole genome sequence. And so um, that, that technology is really going to improve. And number two, it's, it's really clear in, in my medical, among my medical colleagues that they're looking beyond the sequence. They're looking to the um, whole systems biology, uh, as, as many of you are in the scientific world as George is, they're looking beyond the scaffolding of the sequence and talking about uh, gene expression. They're looking at proteomics, at metabolomics, at interactions that are much more complex than the simple scaffolding of the genome. And, and they're really feeling like that's where the payoff is going to be for developing new medications and new treatments. Yeah, I, I would agree with that because for example, for Down syndrome, the sequence doesn't help you necessarily. I mean, the sequence is roughly the same in every individual um, in the chromosome 21 area, um, only because they have that, the consequences of the extra chromosome 21. So there, the treatment would be a systems biology related treatment. And so I'm just, I don't know all, all of your personal experiences, so I'm going to find out too. But um, as experts, you kind of have a unique perspective, you're gathering evidence about the utility of this information, but have you yourself gotten sequenced and what has your experience been? I know, I know that Robert has, so maybe you could start. Okay, yeah, I, I uh, participated in the 23andMe pilot exome program where I got my exome early on and then also participated in the Illumina Understand Your Genome program, then donated my genome to, uh, and exome to um, PGP. Um, so I've been, you know, deeply interested in this, and, and just, just as Michael has described, trying to teach myself something about the informatics of it by delving into my own, my own genome. So um, it's, been, it's been exciting. It's been very um, illuminating for me. Have you guys? So I have not, uh, although I, I say that with not having actually yet had the opportunity, so that's a hypothetical decision yeah. more than an actual decision. You know, I, I was trying to think, because you sent this to us earlier, so the students, a few students have asked me about this, what I would do in their situation. And I think at first I was very coy because I didn't want to be directive with them about their decision-making process. I think over time that's changed a little bit and I've actually grown to be more directive with them based on the experiences that we've seen to try to say that it's okay to pass up this opportunity. I think if I had the choice, I would actually say no. Uh, and the reasons are twofold. One, I, I know myself and my, uh, exp what I think my experience will be with that information. Uh, the other is, you know, in some ways it's a little bit of doing uh, as a hobby what I do for my day job. Uh, so uh, there's a little bit of that side too. So although that's again all in the hypothetical and I imagine I will have to make that choice for real very soon and I think it can be a very different experience then than it is sort of just guessing. So I have not either. Because and but I, but I'm on the waiting list for Illumina's understanding your genome. But interestingly, my interest was not 
so much for my personal health, but to be a better physician. So I signed up for the waiting list when I had my first patient go through the Understanding Your, Your Genome program through Illumina and when I got the patient's results. I wanted to, you know, going through it with the patient, I wanted to also have the experience so that I would be able to empathize more with them, which is something that you mentioned in your talk. That's great. <laughs> Do you want a question? Um, yeah. We have a microphone. Oh, oh or there's a. <laughs> I think he was. Okay. Yeah, so a, a quick question. So, in terms of uh, identifying patients for that are at high risk for non-invasive um, ne neonatal screening, um, is there a genetic component to that, and would that then mean? in terms of uh, the high risk, and, and would that mean that then you would need to sequence the mother or the parent's genomes? So currently, the risk is determined on the basis of aneuploidy, meaning the pregnant woman is at high risk for having a fetus with a whole chromosome aneuploidy, so either trisomies 13, 18, or 21. If you're at high risk, and if, you, if you're known to be a carrier of a Mendelian disorder, you would not be, be having this type of sequencing. Currently, um, the only people that I know of who are Mendelian carriers who are having sequencing done prenatally are, are being done through a research protocol, not clinically. The examples I gave were all commercially CLIA certified laboratory type of testing. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Esther Dyson. I'm on the board of 23andMe, and I apologize, but I just want to correct a small error, which is that 23andMe is not entirely shut down by the FDA. We're working with them, and you can get your data. What you cannot get is the interpretation. And just because of who this audience is, I wanted to make sure you all walked out of here with the correct information. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to imply otherwise. I, I know that to be true. Actually, that's an, uh, I feel like the interpretation is kind of the big question. Now that the technology is basically getting cheaper, is, is in range, like, how do you, in each of your different areas, see interpretation having, where is it like a home run? You can really tell useful information, and where are the gray areas, and where are the opportunities? I mean, I thought it was really interesting to the incidental findings prenatally, like, might have, you know, I'm sure a woman would be glad to know as soon as possible <laughs> that she has cancer, but then I know you've Well, you'd be surprised. Could I just correct oh, you on oh, that? Oh, okay. Because we, we were writing um, an IRB protocol recently at Tufts, and the head of the IRB happens to be an oncologist, and I put it as a benefit of the protocol that the woman could potentially find out that she uh -huh. had a solid tumor, and the oncologist said no, that that had to be under risks that there's no clear-cut mm -hmm. demonstration that knowing ahead of time if you're clinically asymptomatic is going to improve your care. So that would be the assumption that okay. I would have <laughs> and agreeing I mean, with you, but he didn't agree with me. And you've had the same kind of uh, debate happen with the um, incidental findings issue, so I'm just wondering. Well, right. I mean, the, the question of benefit or harm is a multi-step question. It's whether the, the information that's delivered is accurate and who, who judges whether it's accurate or not. It's whether the individual hears it in the way it's delivered. It's then whether they, either with or without medical um, supervision, act on it in a way that is beneficial. It's whether then, then there are actual medical benefits based on their action or not, and whether those are short-term or long-term, and how much the whole thing costs to society versus not doing it at all, and whether there are downstream inadvertent Arms. So we all know from the, um, the PSA story and uh, hormone replacement for women and heart disease story that uh, things that we deeply believed were beneficial uh, had inadvertent harms. Uh, and, and so we've become more sophisticated in evaluating what, something that appears to be beneficial but could actually create downstream uh, harms. Um. Rodrigo Martinez, um, Robert, I find the, the study fascinating, and I wonder if there was something there that asked the participants. There's obviously a, a close link, and especially in this community, between everything genomes and medical. But the linkage is, you know, medical for most of us is 1% of our life. You know, it's 
out, out there. So was there something about who would they trust or who would they share their data that is not their doctor? The last place where I would take right now, if you give me my whole genome right now, the last place I would take it is my doctor at Beth Israel, because I'm still waiting for a fax from two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I, w I would probably try to analyze it and use it in other places of my life, where, is where I buy groceries, where I buy food, where I go socially, where I do exercise. Is there something in the study that shows where else would the participants go and share and try to make sense of it rather than only through the medical side? Well, very much so. I mean, R Rodrigo, as you have made this point uh, eloquently, the, the degree to which the medical system is dysfunctional with our information is, 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 is staggering. And the degree to which it partitions itself off from the rest of our life is uh, remarkable. And in the REVEAL study, for, for 12 years, we've given people just the simple APOE risk information and we saw that within this very constrained model where there is absolutely nothing proven that you can do to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease, people did all sorts of things with the information. They changed their insurance purchases. They changed their diet. They talked to their family in different ways. This is upsetting to some, but empowering to others. So um, we and others coined this term personal utility to, to talk about the ways that are not constrained to medicine, that people use information. And it continues to be controversial because uh, medical doctors and uh, medical scientists are most comfortable talking about medical utility. So it's, it's really different worlds. Could I, could I address that too? I think one of the reasons why most people are uncomfortable sharing it with their doctors is their doctors are not trained in genetics or genomics. And that's why Michael's work is so important. But it doesn't address the hundreds of thousands of practicing physicians who had very little genetic training and who are still thinking about bar bodies. I mean, it's ridiculous. So people always ask me, how did NIPT get incorporated so quickly? And it's really through social media. The majority of practicing primary obstetricians know nothing about this. Social media has had a huge effect. Did you have a question? So one area that I think has right now very clearly actionable results but doesn't seem to have been incorporated at all into the healthcare system except in oncology is the pharmacogenetic genomics where, for example, I know I'm a warfarin or metabolizer because it's one of the SNP data and it was reconfirmed in my WGS. Uh, I'm also out of sleep apnea, so I'm at high risk for stroke. It would be really nice if my medical record said that I'm a orphan over metabolizer, so I don't bleed out, right. you know, when I have a stroke and they treat me. There's, you know, metformin is another one where they know there are clear metabolism issues based on your genome. Why haven't we seen at least these things where, you know, the wrong time to find this out is after you've been treated or when you've been inappropriately <laughs> dosed? Why, why is this one area not getting incorporated more into practice and into getting into medical records now? So this is actually something we talked a lot about. We organized another course this semester about the economic value of this information, and pharmacogenomics was one of the drivers for that. It coincided with the two big warfarin studies that came out that showed that in terms of sort of large-scale clinical utility that there was not. And I think the heart of it is that there are a huge number of systematic roadblocks in how you actually deliver care that drive that. And as a healthcare system, we had a great lecture in the classroom, uh, Jean Sebastian Hulot is an expert on Plavix, which is, has this very strong pharmacogenomic indicator. And his basic point was, as a healthcare system, we know better how to develop and deploy a new drug than we know how to deploy genetic testing at large scale. So it is easier for us to spend the time and the money to develop the follow-on to clopidogrel than it is for us to incorporate CYP2C19 testing regardless of what it says on the label. So as a system, that is just a system challenge that's lurking there. And I think that's really the heart of that issue. And there are only a few places where those results can actually even be in your medical record in a way that would show up to the prescribing physician when they went to make that choice. I would imagine that if they had the clinical decision support that said when you went to make the prescription in Epic that, hey, this is not a good idea for this person, then most people would change their mind, but they're almost never going to see that warning. And to sort of follow on why, I think also it's a question of epidemiology versus personal experience. So for Clopidogrel, even if that portion of the drug, which also includes aspirin, does not work for you, 
that number increase in adverse events is really small. So it shows up epidemiologically, but it doesn't show up personally to a physician. So you may start ordering that test, but you don't see any meaningful results, and you won't, and so you stop. And there's also a large, it's, it's counterintuitive, but there's a real possibility that, that launching some pharmacogenomic um, decision support could have an unintended harmful effect. Let me, let me give you an example. There's a variant that tells you if your risk of um, severe muscle damage with statins goes from about 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 10,000. Now, that risk is still very, very small. But, but you'd think, well, that's kind of a natural one to, to pop up when you're about to prescribe statins. But if physicians have that pop up in the 30 or 40% of people carrying that variant, <coughs> and they um, hesitate about prescribing the statin, or the patient, and we know patients are terribly compliant anyway, hears that and says, you know, I'm not, I really don't want to take this drug you're suggesting. We've introduced into the system two ways to give that patient an excuse not to take the drug, and we know that drug has lowered the risk of stroke and heart disease. So we could inadvertently do great public health harm with the best of intentions, by introducing that into the public health matrix. We just have to be thoughtful about that and, and really collect data. Um, as This is Ryan speaking. Um, as a follow-on to that, uh, Michael, it seems to me that p the most important part in all this is the education of the physician. I understand there's structural and systemic reasons why including uh, pharmacogenomics is so hard. But it occurred to me, and I, and I have to admit, I was distressed by the question that you raised at the end of your talk, which is, is it worthwhile for these students to be a, even looking at this? If you had started that course with asking, physician, asking these students to interpret the PGX report that a patient came in with, or the prenatal screening that a patient came in with, and they were asked to actually make sense of it, and that was part of the study, that discomfort, that anxiety, that inability that they would feel at the beginning would be really interesting to test after they'd gone through their personal um, sequencing. I feel like to just ask students whether or not it's worthwhile to have learned information that everybody in this room knows right now is, you know, of in many cases of low value. Is it important for a physician to potentially learn how to communicate with patients? Um, and be sensitive and empathic, as, as uh, Diane mentioned. I, I just think you're, you're asking the wrong questions. No, I think that's really a, an excellent point, and I, I think you're absolutely right, and that was one of the motivations for why we wanted to incorporate this type of information into the experience. And one of the challenges we've had is coming up with the right set of questions to ask in this context, because there's not, and I know Robert probably knows even better, that there's actually not a great set of questions out there to ask in this kind of setting where healthy individuals are receiving really complex genetic information, and particularly when those healthy individuals are providers, not, uh, or should be, or will be providers. I think at the same time, we also do struggle because we don't think that looking at your own genome can and should be a prerequisite to practicing in this area, right? And that uh, you should be able, we should be able to train you to do the things that you need to do without you personally having that experience. And that's another side of the question as well. So, you know, we've been really interested if you had great questions that we could incorporate into that because that touch on some of those issues. And I think actually supplying a report, maybe like Robert's report, as part of that sort of knowledge thing would actually be a really great exercise, sort of prerequisite exercise to sort of assess what's happening. So we only have time for two more questions and there's two mics out there. I see Cliff and then uh, Dan, you can ask me. Actually, okay. you both, you, Dan, why don't you ask your question? All right. Dan, ask your question. Uh, this is mostly for Dr. Green, but all of you. Um, we have about 100 PGP participants here today, and I think most of us went into this because we're interested in advancing science, and we're really not interested in personally what we have, but unexpected things come up. So the question to you is if we don't go to our doctors, how do we get to a genetic counselor on something that we don't expect? Well, um, as George and, and Jason know, um, we have a clinic, and we would be happy to see you in clinic and go over that. Uh, I'm a medical geneticist. I work with genetic counselors, Sarah's over there, and, and others who, who would, we'd be happy to see you personally. If you're not local to Boston, 
um, we can refer you to people who could uh, help you medically interpret what, what you may have found in your genome. Yeah, and, and I would say we have the same situation at Tufts, and we, we've had people flying in even from other countries to discuss you their genomes. Was your resource National Society? Genetic Council. NSGC. NSGC. Uh, piggybacking on the last question, we're all apostles here, and had you thought at uh, Harvard the possibility of dumbing down the summer course uh, and making it available online uh, to so people would know the complexity of the issue and how to get involved. Yeah, so I think there's a couple things. So one, I, I think this year we're looking into videotaping. Two, and I can plug because Conrad's sitting right there. There's actually, he and Joel Dudley wrote a book that's sort of a good, more accessible summary of a lot of these issues. I'm totally blanking on the title, so he can yell it out. Exploring Personal Genomics. Exploring Personal Genomics, which I think is actually a, a, a good resource for getting at a number of these questions. So yes, we've definitely been sort of working to expand that out. One big change, the first year, the introductory course was only for the students going on to the follow. We've since expanded out to the entire community, and we've had everything from intensive care nurses to other faculty to a whole host of, of folks for that very reason, because they want to get experience with this. Oh, that's great. But this is not for the faint of heart. I mean, I, 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 you should take the last word, because I sat down with you for two <laughs> hours and, and, and showed you what I was trying to learn in terms of interpreting my own genome. As, as a board-certified medical geneticist, I don't actually have the tools to do this. I've had to try to learn them from some of the people in this room and, and uh, others, and, and uh, it, 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 was, it, was it was complex. A, yeah, it was a long. I'm sure you've all done this personally, but it was uh, eye-opening for me. So this is. We're, we're actually going to do two more questions oh, here real quick. Uh, okay. I, I, I left off a few people who I promised questions. So if we're going to do one, two, the first question, the second question, and then a quick response. I'll try to make one quick, but I appreciate all y'all's what you shared with us. I want to play devil's advocate just for a minute about this idea of sequencing one, like one and done, and bring up the difference between germline and somatic sequence. And so the idea of having it once early and then watching it progress, um, because some of the things you find, incidentally, are somatic mutations, for you, the, the cancers. Um, so what are your thoughts <coughs> on, will there be, will we have multiple sequencing over lifetimes? Will we? Will we target somatic tissue? Well, I would agree. I think we're going to. I think we're going to multiply sequence. I think we're going to multiply sequence ourselves over a lifetime for, for the reasons you mentioned, and also because the technology is going to improve uh, and be faster, and maybe even be faster resequence than just and cheaper than to store the data uh, when all, all is said and done. But if you're concerned about the germ line, it's germ line, it's a lot easier for a man to contribute a sample than a woman. So it's, you know, if you're you're a woman and you're worried about your eggs, for example, you're never going to be able to get the eggs non-invasively. So that's just something to be. Yeah, I'm a germline in genetics. Yeah. It's constitutional. Yeah. Hi. My name's Kelly, and I, I got into the program here. Um, I had serious adverse reactions to the point of near death um, and found out once I was sequenced, I have a lot of enzyme deficiencies. And I was curious to note, education-wise, about nutrigenomics. Um, I've been off, I was at one point on 21 meds a day for Crohn's disease and other things. So I've been researching through UC Davis and stuff, uh, nutrigenomics, and wondered how, um, if you guys have come across studies with that and replacing pharmacogenomics and medications looking more to that natural avenue. Um, advocates for that study, research? I'm sorry, you, you had personal difficulties and I hope they're better now. Um, the problem with getting there. The whole problem with nutrigenomics in, in general as a field in our society is that they've been able to carve out a market for themselves without the kind of rigorous scientific evidence mm. that we apply to the rest of medicine. So it's really hard to separate out fact from fiction and um, perhaps very useful elements of it from more fraudulent elements of it. Uh, so it's a, it's a very tough area to comment on as a whole. 
Thank you so much for uh, all your questions and to our speakers.